This morning I want to read out of Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15. We're going to read, Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, <clears throat> giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. Help me, Heavenly Father, as your humble bond servant, to accurately and rightly divide your word of truth, to proclaim your truth. It is so awesome to have and to hold your word, to read your truth, to understand your will, to see your holiness and your instruction, that we be holy as you are holy. We see our need for salvation. We see your provision for that. Redemption through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. While we were dead in our trespasses and sins, while we were at enmity with you, you loved us and you sent your only begotten Son. Your mercy is grace. Your mercy is great and your grace is free. Lord, we thank you for providing your Holy Spirit. We live in a world that hates you, tries to ignore or reject you. So help us to honor you more to proclaim your truth more boldly, to understand your word more deeply, to know your love more fully, and to obey you more fervently. Lord, we ask for wisdom from you, from your word, and little crumbs from your table that we might live, that we might walk as you would have us walk. Amen. In this passage, Paul describes a choice on how we are, how we can, and how we ought to walk. This word "walk" is the same walk, the same word that's used for when Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, when he's when he's telling the lame man to get up and walk, or just recently when we read in in John when he was walking on the water. I don't say that to spiritualize the word "walk." It, I'm just trying to describe, this is the same word that's used to walk. The same word I would use to walk my dog. But in this scenario, this word is being used to describe how we navigate the course of life. So going back to the choice that we have here. It says, look carefully how you walk. Well, how might we walk? This word then could easily be overlooked, but it's the same word that could be translated therefore. It connects two passages. It, it's because of this, let's consider that. Throughout Ephesians, Paul has been using this word walk to describe two extremes. So if you turn back with me with to Ephesians 2, Paul reminds us what we've been saved from. Every single one of us was born a sinner. Every single one of us has sinned. We've sinned before a righteous and a holy God. And the consequences of that is death. So we read in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 2. No, let's go ahead and start in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is how we once walked. We followed the course of this world. 
Now, this world has a lot of beauty in creation. <clears throat> it points us to God's eternal power and his divine nature. But this world is also filled with sin and corruption, following the power of this air, uh, power of the air, and the same spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. <clears throat> in our small group, we've brought up and been reminded of a time in our lives when we had a passion for sin. We only knew how to sin. Sometimes we even delighted in our sin. That's how we walked. We were dead in our trespasses and our sins, just as we read here. We had no knowledge of a life that was different or how we could change, how we could, how we could transform. We heard about stuff, but we didn't know how. How can a dead man come to life? How can he even know what life is <clears throat> and how to get there? We were helpless, we were hopeless, we were powerless. Paul continues, praise God, Paul continues. In verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. There it is. Did you see it? The transformation. We were dead. We were following the course of this world. And God's mercy, because of his great love, he provides grace. He provides uh, grace through faith made us alive together with Christ. Not of works, so none of us can boast. We went from dead <clears throat> to his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, that we should walk in them. We were walking that way in death. Suddenly we're walking that way. Paul continues through Ephesians, continues describing the mystery of the gospel, how it was revealed, and he prays for the Ephesians. We were discussing this morning in Sunday school about prayer. <clears throat> you want to know how to pray for Christians, or how to pray for believers? It's a great example in Ephesians 3 of how he prays for the Ephesians, that they would grow to know the love of Christ. Then, when he gets into Ephesians 4, through the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> he writes and we read, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. So we are to walk in good works, <clears throat> yes, but we're also to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Paul urges them, he besieges them. You were dead in your trespasses and your sins. God made you alive. You're now his workmanship, created to walk in good works. Walk in a manner worthy of that. How? Well, he provides a, a little bit more instruction here, so let's continue in verse 2. With all humility, it's not you, him, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the hope, the one hope that belongs to your call, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Praise God indeed. God is, is great and he provides us instruction. How do we walk in a manner worthy of his calling? Humble, gentle, with patience, bearing with one another. We have to bear with one another. <laughs> At times that can be challenging, but what we're striving for is the unity of the body of Christ. And he describes God's provision for that. And he's not done. He describes the equipping of the saints as he continues in Ephesians 4. How to build up the body of Christ. That we, that we would not be too, tossed to and fro by winds of doctrine or by human cunning or by deceitful schemes. Then he continues in verse 17 of, of chapter 4. Now this I say, and testify in the Lord, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. See, Ephesians were in a culture surrounded by Gentiles that did not know God. They didn't understand God. They were ignorant. They had hard hearts. They were giving themselves up to sensuality, to greed, to impurity. Don't walk as they do. That, does that actually sound a little familiar? Sounds like the world we live in. You were once dead and walked according to the course of this world. If God saved you, you've been created to walk in good works. Walk worthy of that vocation. You still live in a world. Don't walk as the Gentiles. Don't walk as the lost around you. You're walking in darkness. You don't know what they're stumbling over. They're giving themselves over to their sinful lusts and desires. Don't give an opportunity for the devil. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving, as he says in, in verse 32. Forgiving one another as Christ, God in Christ forgave you. Do you remember how this grace came to us? while we were dead, came to us by God's great love. You want to know how to live, how to walk? Continues in chapter 5. Let's continue in that same kind of love. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are to walk in good works. We are to walk worthy of that calling. We are to walk in love. What kind of love? Well, the same kind of love that Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. We didn't deserve that. We didn't earn that. We were dead in our trespasses and our sins. We struggle to walk in love Oh, you don't know who I have to work with. <laughs> There's this, this person that I have to deal with all the time. You don't know what I have to deal with. They're unlovable. Well, so was I when God loved me. So were you when God loved you. Walk in love. Continues on. Read in verse 8. Verse 8 of chapter 5. For at one time you were 
darkness. But now you are the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the, li the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part of the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. We were once in that darkness, but now we're in the light. Walk as children of the light. Instead of walking in darkness, walk in light. I actually used to have this picture in my mind. Excuse me. Well, I was walking through the course of my life. It seemed like I was stumbling over things and I didn't know what I was stumbling over. I just knew that, you know, I was just kind of wandering through life and troubles would pop up and I didn't know how to deal with the troubles. I didn't know how to make decisions, how to navigate through the course of light, life. And I started reading God's word and applying God's word. And he saved me, yes. But as I continued walking in that truth, I started realizing it's like there's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And sure enough, there's a scripture that reinforces that. That's absolutely what's going on. God's word does provide us instruction of how to walk as children of light. This is just the intro. To lay the foundation for how did we walk? walked in darkness, walked in death, walked as children of wrath, how we ought to walk. But now we've arrived at our text in chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So we're to walk in wisdom as well. Examine, look carefully, consider, take seriously how you walk. You've seen two paths. Don't be foolish, but be wise. You want to see an urgent plea in Scripture? One that we ought to seize? One coupled with a terrifying warning as well? In Proverbs, Proverbs 1, a familiar passage, but I want to go ahead and read it to let this sink in a little bit more. Proverbs 1, starting in verse 20, we read that wisdom cries aloud in the streets, in the markets. She raises her voice at the head of the noisy streets. She cries out at the entrance of the city gates. She speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. This is the plea. There's an opportunity here. Turn in quickly while there's still time. And then the scene seems to darken metaphorically. Time's running out. Wisdom is not being heeded. We continue in verse 24. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I will also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when terror strikes you, when terror strikes like a storm, when your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge, they did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat of the fruit of their ways and have the fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Look carefully then how you walk, 
in wisdom, in love, in light, in good works because of a new life in Christ, or in foolishness, in darkness, in death, in sinful passions and lusts. Choose the fear of the Lord. If we fear the Lord rightly, we should not fear anything that man can do to us. Fear him, honor him, and avoid pursuing foolishness. It's the same foolishness that we actually hear and read of in in Romans 1. In Romans 1, starting in 21, we read, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So wisdom is exchanged for foolishness. What is true, that God created, we see that, we see his divine nature. We see his eternal power. They exchange that for foolishness, for darkness. Just do what feels right. Do what you want to do. The lie that started in, in the Garden of Eden is still at work today. Did God really say? We hear that sometimes on a daily basis. Avoid that kind of foolishness. Look carefully how you walk. Do not be unwise, but be wise. He continues on in Ephesians. He says, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Just like in Proverbs 1, when there's this limited time, we need to make the best use of time. The idea here is buy it up now while you still can. There's a sale going on. Don't know when it's going to end. Buy it now. Make the best use of time right now because the days are evil. Is this just a general, you know, hey, we live in a sin-cursed world. The days are evil. Certainly that's true. I mean, we're not promised the rest of tomorrow. We're not promised the rest of today. Not promised next month. So there's an urgency as well. Now, Paul actually knew the Ephesians. He lived with them. Uh, he actually re- remembers uh, a time when he served with the Ephesians in a, in Acts 20. And in Acts 20, he was writing to the Ephesian elders. He was concerned about wolves coming in among them. And in Acts 20, starting in verse 28, we read, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. See, he's talking to the elders here, those that are overseeing, to care for the church, which he obtained with his own blood. God loves the church. Continuing, he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. We need to be on our guard. Buying up the best use of time, making the best use of time knowing our time's limited, knowing that evil's always crouching, ready to pounce. Just years later, we read the letter to the Ephesians in in Revelation, Revelation 2. Remember, there were the seven letters that were provided. One of them was to the Ephesians. One thing that's good is they did heed some of the warning. Because we read, starting in verse 2, 
I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that they are in, that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. That's that's great. I mean, they did they did avoid a good number of pitfalls, but they still they still had an area they needed to focus on. Chapter. Uh, verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. We want to make the best use of time, because the days are evil. We have a limited time. We want to continue to stay on guard. I was, I was just talking to a neighbor recently about international missions, how things have changed. How, how could we even imagine things have changed in two years? There are some countries that have still closed their borders. They're not letting people in. The time... It's no longer there. We don't always have the same opportunities that we have today. Make the best use of time. In addition to making the best use of time, we receive another warning against foolishness. In verse 17, we read, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. How can we understand that? Primary mechanism is right here. God's word. Sometimes it's latent. It's very specific. It's God's will that we be sanctified. First Thessalonians 4.3 It's God's will that we be thankful. First Thessalonians 5.18 it's God's will that we do good and that we submit to one another. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 15. God's will should be our delight and even in our prayers. We were, again, talking about that this morning. Praying for God's will to be done. Patterned in the Lord's Prayer. In my workplace, again, I, I get to work with believers. And when we evaluate decisions and choices and how we understand something, I, I love to interject scripture because what that's doing for me is it's causing that filter. It's making sure that I'm not being simply drawn by my heart, but I'm evaluating my choices, my thinking through the word of God. Because I know that my heart just like yours, it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I invite my peers to challenge me. If I'm, if I'm not thinking right, help me with that. If I'm taking it out of context, call me on that. That's a way that we can look carefully then how I walk by taking heed according to the Word of God meditating on it day and night. All right, so we're to avoid foolishness and understand the will of, the, of God, but we're also to be filled with the Spirit. Verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, Pastor Ryan talked about this whole topic of drunkenness recently, and so I won't belabor that point. But the emphasis here is do not get drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. How do we do that? There's different ideas about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to lift this passage out of context and say, be filled with the Spirit, and therefore this is what it means. I think this is how it feels to me, or here's how, how I heard someone else say this. 
we're not going to lift it out of context and just make it mean whatever we want it to mean. We want to look at it in context and contrast it with what does it mean to be drunk? Well, there's a loss of capacity or thinking, the debauchery that comes with that. I grew up in Wisconsin, and um, it was just standard tradition that every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, uh, every Easter, we'd get together at my great-grandmother's house. A good time of fellowship. She put on this feast. Uh, it was just a good time of getting the family together. And being of good German heritage, they would pull out the beer, and they would pull out other mixed drinks that I don't even know what that was, but whatever. Um, and while the kids were getting together and playing and exploring the neighborhood and um, having fun together, the adults were sometimes getting a little bit more loud and boisterous and their behaviors changed. I saw a, a change in pattern. For me, when I grew up, that's just something that I want to avoid. I don't want to let something else, I don't want to deviate from letting God be first and foremost in my life. It's this idea of if, if that becomes our passion, we can allow it to get too far and, and fall into drunkenness. Where's your happiness? Where's your joy? Is it in the things that you do, or is it in Christ, in what God is providing? Be filled with the Spirit. How can we do any of the previous things that we've talked about without being filled in the Spirit? How can we love with agape love without being filled with the Spirit? How can we walk in the light. How can we even understand the light without being filled with the Spirit? This word filled is to make full and to continue making full. It's like when you go to a restaurant where the, the wait staff is top notch. You go to drink a little bit of water, you set that glass down, and all of a sudden it's full again. It's, it's full and keep filling continual effort. Before you can fill something, there has to be an open space. When we're filled with drunkenness, when we're filled with debauchery, when we're filled with sin, we can't be filled with the Spirit. We need to make sure that we're not harboring sin, that we're not that we are confessing it, that we're repenting. That's vital to being filled with the Spirit. We see in the context, being filled with the Spirit is immediately paired up with specific behaviors. Reading in verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. This is worshiping together in song. We just did that. This includes the one another, as we see here. We should worship individually. We should be able to sing and praise God individually. But we are also commanded and told to come together and worship in song as well. Corporate worship. This is worship to the Lord with your heart. It's not just lip service. It's with your heart. This kind of worship should glorify God. It should be genuine. The Israelites took worship very seriously. They put a lot of practice into it. And when they were coming out of Egypt, when they did things inappropriate, there was death. God is holy, He's righteous. We should take it seriously. We should worship the Lord 
with our heart. Additionally, we read, we should give thanks. In verse 20, it says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read from Romans 1 earlier. Remember the core dysfunction of that was combined with when God, when people did not honor God as God, they also didn't thank God. We reading it again out of Romans 1 21. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. First, they didn't honor him as God, and they didn't give thanks to him. Are we always thankful? Or do we have to wait for that November season to come around before we start thinking about thankfulness? We ought to be patterned by thanking God. We're talking about that again this morning in prayer. So much of our the prayer that we read in the Old Testament, New Testament, it's filled with praise to God, yes, but it's filled with thanksgiving to God because he provides everything. We need him for everything. In addition to worshiping and singing and thanking God, we're also to submit to one another. We read in, in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Why do we submit to one another? Out of reverence for Christ. So much of this is captured in the fruit of the Spirit. We are filled with the Spirit. We can and we do produce the fruit of the Spirit. goes together. If you want more detail of what submitting to one another looks like, continue reading. Because he, he goes into much more detail. Wives, how do wives submit? Husbands, how are they to submit? Children, fathers, bond servants, masters. Masters submitting? Yes. Because they know that they still are accountable to God. We all submit. We are to submit to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. So we are to look carefully then how we walk. Are you being wise? Or are you being unwise? Are you making the best use of time? Do you understand the will of the Lord? Or are you foolish? Are you being filled with the Spirit or debauchery? Are you worshiping in psalm with your heart? With your heart. Are you giving thanks always and in everything to God? Are you submitting to one another? out of reverence for Christ? It's a quick little summary of a good portion of Ephesians. And hope that provides uh, good instruction based on God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is perfect, enlightening the eyes. We're reminded once again of your great love for us. While we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we could not earn salvation. Through the best of our sacrifice, through the best of our works, you offered salvation through Jesus Christ, that perfect sacrifice for our sins. You demonstrated your eternal power and your divine nature, and you've given us your word. We ask for wisdom from you through your spirit so that we can walk in good works worthy of your calling, in love, as children of light, wisdom. Help us make the best use of time. Help us understand your will, seek your will,
pray for your will, to live according to your will. Fill us with your spirit. Help us see our sin for what it is and repent. We do worship you because you alone are worthy of worship. Give you thanks for everything. The daily bread you provide us, for the shelter you've provided us, for this body of believers to edify one another, for Pastor Ryan and his family who are hopefully able to unplug and recharge a bit this week, for your word that provides a light for our path, for your Holy Spirit who guides us in all truth, for Jesus and the perfect sacrifice who provided redemption and new life in Christ for your sovereignty in everything. Please forgive us where we've been unthankful. Keep us from wandering from gratitude to you. Help us to submit to one another. It's challenging at times. As pride creeps in. Lord, help us to be faithful. Walk according to your holy words of truth. Please continue to bless us and lead us as a church as we seek you, as we strive to glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.